Um, I'm going to start off with uh, a three minute intro video, power, PowerPoint uh, for you to watch. It's only three minutes, so if anyone's falling asleep, I'm going to catch you. I will catch you. So uh, hopefully you find it beneficial so you see my history and how I got to uh, where I am today. Reno Ursal, Philippine ex American dad, and author of young adult novel Enlightenment, book one of the Bahala series. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Reno Writes. At Reno Writes. I appreciate any love you can give me on social media. Today, I am going to speak to you about my time at Basra and what life has been like after the University of Michigan. So let's try to get through this quickly, shall we? I was born in Guyana, raised in Rogers City, Michigan, and now live in Mountain House, California. So how does a Filipino American kid get from Rogers City to Michigan all the way to California? Bueller? 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 It's all because of my time at University of Michigan. I was FASA president in 92 and 93, the co-founder of FASA, and director of the N5 conference in 95, and I won the Lifetime Achievement Award for the AP community. This time I made some great friends and I was just like you, a student at the University of Michigan, wondering what was next. I found myself looking for more involvement in the community and I moved to California and I worked for a Filipinx American label, Classified Records. I was fortunate enough to be a behind the scenes player in the 90s Filipinx music movement that included artists like Jocelyn Enriquez, Kanai, Kai, One Voice, Jonathan Harmony, and Julie Clark, to name a few. And working for a label that was Filipino owned was a sense of pride for me. And it was during this crazy time that I met a girl from Alameda, California. And we got married in the year 2000. And I became a father later in the year when my first daughter, Alyssa Lynn, was born. And in 2020, she turned 20. My second daughter, Raylan, turned 17. And my son, Noah, turned 15. And once my family started, I worked in Silicon Valley before moving on to a career in property tax while burning the midnight oil, writing a few songs, writing a few screenplays, and working on a novel series where the first book was released in 2019. It's been quite a ride, and I can tell you, my time at Boston and at Michigan has completely steered my direction in life. It is my hope that you take your experiences to foster your personal and professional relationships so you can tell your story 20 years from now. Just never forget, your Filipino American story matters. So I hope you enjoyed that. Um, whenever I get these talks, I like to give a uh, frame of reference from where I came from. And I always end the screen with no history, no self, no history, no self. Because you need to know where you came from and how you get to where you want to go. Um, I've been in your place as a student at Michigan. And when I was a student at Michigan and at FASA, 
I'm, I'm a Midwest boy who grew up in Northern Michigan in Rogers City, Michigan. So when I went to Ann Arbor, that was the first time I was exposed to more Filipinos beyond the medical associations that I went to. My parents were both doctors. My dad, Concordia Ursel, is a general surgeon. My mom is a general practitioner. So my freshman year, I was kinesiology major. And um, from there, I became an English major my sophomore year. So there was a major shift there. Um, and the, there are five points I'm gonna talk about in my time allotted and that I hope that I hope you can take home and think about. Um, Cause there's no clear cut answer about what life will be like after University of Michigan. Um, and this is just from my experience. So my experience as a male Filipino American, all right? Um, the first question you have to ask yourself is, does your Filipino American identity matter? And the first thing you need to know is what your history tells you. So without going into a long history uh, diatribe, I'm gonna point out two years that you should, you should know. 1934, the Tidings McDuffie Act limited Filipino immigration to 50 per year until World War II. 1965, the Immigration and Nationality Act removed nation origin quotas that favored European immigrants. So what does that mean for us as Filipino Americans? That means that we were able to immigrate in large numbers to the United States. And in the Philippines, there were a large number of nurses, physicians, and med techs that were over, overly represented in those fields. So where did they go? They went to the United States and a large number of them went to Illinois and Michigan and New York. So there's a large professional uh, level of immigrant, immigrants from the Philippines that we are descendants of. You may be a descendant of those immigrants. Your own family story is your own family story. So you should be able to connect the dots knowing those two dates in, in time. What is the reality of the perception when you're outside of Michigan as a Filipino American? Um, the general perception is that Filipinos are great nurses and doctors and there's less of that in 2020. But in my day, that was a prominent stereotype. Uh, you can probably tell me more if that's still a stereotype within your age range and your generation, but that tends to be one still. Um, what is the reality? Anyone outside of the medical field has a lot to prove if you're a Filipino American. I could give you two personal ex experiences I have in a corporate setting where for me, it took me quite a bit of time. I'm in, a, in my day job, I'm a property tax consultant. And what does that mean? Well, it's a lot of fun stuff to do with budgeting and real estate. And for me to get into a supervising position, um, I had to prove to people who were already at those levels who are predominantly of the majority, and in this case, European, of European descent, that I, was, that I was worthy to be a manager. And um, if you go on our Zoom calls from my company, you'll still see all of them are white. There is no other ethnicity in our corporate setting who are managers, directors um, at that level. And whenever I'm in those meetings, I make it a point to know my stuff and to be able to uh, speak their language in order for them to understand that I know, I know that I'm Filipino American. They may not know I am, but I know I am. And I know the history that I have to fight against in order to prove that I am able to communicate with them in that setting. The other part of it too is, I know I'm a five foot four Filipino man. So how do they perceive me? How do they perceive you as a Filipino American? Well, that is gonna be a difficult thing to uh, know unless you know that person. Because um, there's gonna be people from all gamuts of backgrounds who respect us or don't respect us. So you have to be aware that there's a certain perception of Filipino Americans historically in the United States that you need to digest and understand. And um, the third point I'm gonna make is, is it meritocracy or is it representation? And that's a big debate right now when you think about diversity in the workforce. Is it based on your merit, meritocracy completely? Or is it based on, should we have representation of the population that we serve? So the next question for you is, how do you prepare at U of M? 
So at a show of hands, I'm sure everyone is a nursing major or a business major or an econ major, right? Uh, any other majors I left out there? No? Engineering. 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 There you go. Thanks, Alisa. Um, <laughs> but you're gonna have, I was an English major, so, so I was in the school of LSNA. And uh, the important thing for you to be uh, is you become a subject matter expert. That's how you prepare at U of M. Be a subject matter expert in your major. All right, know your stuff, all right? But also admit that you have a lot to learn. That doesn't mean you know everything, but it means that you know your stuff that you're studying. But always have room to learn more because your education just starts right when you graduate U of M. Trust me. Second, understand economics and money and how that works. So me and Elisa, we can both relate. We're, we're both parents. Uh, but in the stage that you're at, you need to understand how money works and economics behind it. And what is anyone an econ major? You don't have to be an econ major to do this because you have to do it regardless because you're going to get a paycheck someday. So you have to understand where that money came from and then how that money, how you're going to allocate that money towards yourself. All right. And the one, and the one um, economic principle that I want you to take home for yourself is that you have your paycheck, but you save at least in the beginning, five to 10% of it that you don't touch. It goes away. And then you have another 10% or so for fun money. Do what you want with it. Go skydiving, go on a trip, do what you need to do. The other money, pay bills and survival, shelter, food, things like that. So you really have to understand, hopefully, I'm sure you're way ahead than my generation at the same age, how to budget money. But that's something that you should, um, if you're not started on that yet, start to understand that more. Um, you're gonna have a professional career and then you're going to have an artistic interest. Everyone is an artist to some degree. Everybody is an artist to some degree. And um, I have two resumes, one for my professional career as a property tax consultant. All right. And then I have another resume for my artistic career, my other hobbies and interests. One is for writing. So I consistently try to keep those two updated because you never know what opportunities come up in either professional setting. How many people here have, are singers or dancers or have that like interest to be a thespian and be, and be someone outside of who you are, be, outside of your major, outside of your profession? I'm sure a large number of you are gonna be that, are, are that. And if you're not there yet, trust me, you will have other interests outside of your major. So um, my point there is, Prepare yourself for those two identities that you may have a professional career, professional identity, and artistic ident identity, whatever that may be. And again, your education does not stop when you graduate, uh, when you're graduated U of M, it just only begins. The third element I want to talk about is what are the crucial elements that make you happy? I know what makes me happy because I'm hella old, so I already know who I am, right? But you're, when I remember at your age, I thought I knew what would make me happy. I thought I knew. And I, may, I went through some weaves and turns to find out and learn what makes me happy. You can only answer that yourself. Understand you're gonna make mistakes and don't, and, and forgive yourself for those mistakes because those mistakes and failures will only make you stronger, right? Um, as you encounter these experiences, notate them and make sure that you learn from them. Even just making sure that you have a good idea not to maybe repeat mistakes, even though you may repeat a mistake down the road. For me, the, pe the things that make me happy are the people around me, meeting new people, such as yourselves, having new experiences. I just love great conversation. I love sports. I coach basketball and I love to write. And, and those are just sums me up and what makes me happy. The fourth point I wanna make is who do you surround yourself with? So you're gonna talk about, in, in this case, 
it's personally and professionally. Who do you want to surround yourself with? Now, I'm not going to talk about you should get married at this age, you should have kids at this age, you should do this at this age and do this at this age. Throw out all that out the window. Everyone has a different timeline. So, none, and so we should not judge anyone who's not married at 40 or 45 or others who, are, who have kids at 21 or 22. Everyone is on a different timeline. But the important thing is, who do you want to surround yourself with that make you happy? Who are the kind of people that you want to surround yourself? Are they, are they uh, reserved? Are they like to go out every night after work? What are the personality traits? Who are your friends now? Who are your friends now? What do you like about them that makes you want to hang out with them? All right? Do you foresee being friends with them later? All right? So right now is your exploratory stage in life as a freshman, sophomore, junior, senior in college, right? This is the time you figure that out because I, I didn't know when I was in college, I was a DJ at the Nectarine. Is that club still around, the Nectarine? Yeah, so I was a resident DJ there on Thursday nights on Euro night uh, and Saturday nights on disco night. So I've met a lot of people that way. Um, and I, I, through that, those experiences, I was able to figure out the type of people I wanted to get along with. Like I didn't like to go out and just toke up with people after I DJ. That wasn't that wasn't my vibe. Um, I would hang out with people who I could have good conversation with without that element. And we go to Denny's on Washtenaw and hang out after my gigs, and we would have great conversations at Fossa meetings, and um, go to Stucci's. I'm not sure if that's still around. Ice cream socials conversations were always a big part of how I knew if I got along with people for the long term. Think about that for yourself. Who do you want to surround yourself professionally? Who do you want to surround yourself personally? In the professional setting, if you're a nurse, you, if you're going to be a nurse, you're going to gauge the type of people that work at the hospital that you want, that you want um, to get along with or another hospital that may have a different type of personality. And those are the things that you should be gauging. What are the type of people you want to surround yourself on the day to day? And then lastly, what will be your story? What is going to be your story? Everyone has a story. Everyone here on these panels, if I talk to each of you, you each have a unique family history and unique, uh, unique personality. Care for your 65-year-old self now. Care for your 65-year-old uh, self now, economically and emotionally. By this time in your life at 65, you traditionally think you're retired, but what are you going to do in during your prime years to take, your, take care of yourself at that age? And those are some of the principles I live by. That is what my kids hear on a regular basis for me to help prepare them to be self-independent adults. And I think the last important part is to share. Share your story, share your experiences, don't hold it in. Make sure that you are someone who people will want to go to to understand how you got to where you got to be because each of you i'll tell you now will have struggles you will have struggles so the people you want to surround yourself with are the people who will be there when things are bad the people who want you want to be there when things are bad and i'm going to close with a quote that has gotten me a long way all right i've learned that people will forget what you said People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. All right, so that is by the great poet Maya Angelou. Thank you for your time, and I will pass the baton on to Alisa. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Reno. Um, Thanks, Reno. Are you set up? Are you good to go? Yeah. Let me do a screen sharing thing though. Okay, I'm not as um, uh, artistic as Reno, so I'm I'm a PowerPoint uh, professional, I guess. When <laughs> when I went from engineering into management at Boeing, uh, we learned to manage by PowerPoint and Excel. So. Um, 
This is a little bit about me um, from the background um, perspective. Uh, it's pronounced, and, and um, Sean got it right, uh, Lisa Duarte Rye Noggle. Um, born and raised in Troy, Michigan. I uh, actually attended the Paralong Filipino School in um, Metro Detroit area before it became a larger community center. Um, my parents tried to uh, have my sister and I learn Tagalog, but unfortunately we did not take to it. Um, uh, we actually fought against them to to go to these things. We never liked going to all the Filipino events. They were, you know, involved in so many Filipino groups. Um, and then when I got to, um, you know, to Michigan, I actually was sort of reluctant to join FASA, but um, we had these, uh, they had a phone tree and they would call call you for every single meeting. And it was at a coding, <laughs> no, coding Pacifico, um, that would call me all the time. And so I really owe um, her, I, I guess, the credit for me being so involved in FASA. And you can sort of see here from our, our uh, 1996 yearbook, which, um, which Reno headed up. You can see uh, Captain Reno Ursal there and how many hours and pages put into it. Um, we were voted diehard, Miss Diehard FASA and Mr. Diehard FASA. So um, interesting enough, I found that um, in my parents' place when I was helping them clean up. And, uh, and you chose the two diehard FASA people from 1996. Um, so that was um, interesting. I thought I thought that bring bring it up again. But um, really, what happened was also my activity in high school uh, really carried me. I think over into college with the newspaper and literary magazine. So uh, when I moved into um, the college years, uh, I got pulled into the ACA Women's Journal. I don't know if that's still around. Um, one of my friend's older sisters was uh, the editor of that, so I helped them with that when I first joined college. And then that sort of carried on into, with the FASA newsletter, um, you know, got in, more involved with FASA, as you can see there, um, Project Lighthouse. They still did, you know, engineering stuff like solar car and SWE, um, diversity stuff, I'll call it, um, Alliance for Justice, Trotter House. I was a resident there and worked there. And then um, FASA president and Tower, Tower Society. So, you know, for me, um, you know, all, all the while doing my electrical engineering degree, um, and uh, you know, a few jobs on the side. Um, let's see, what did I do with jobs? Um, work there. I, I, I worked in the computing labs, the residence um, resource centers, and I was front desk for uh, for the West Quad front desk. I was um, I did summer uh, front desk for or freshman orientation, and then I did uh, actually diversity training for the freshmen my senior year. Um, and that was really interesting. We um, we tried a different way of of, of uh, introducing diversity. We played, uh, so we were able to make the make up the training ourselves. And um, we actually played voices that we recorded our different friends, and we asked people to imagine, you know, just describe what that person was like. And um, you know, and then at the end we'd show, you know, this is this is what the person is, this is what their major is, this is what they do, and people were like, oh, and they were, you know, totally judging or assessing what that person was like off of their voice. Um, so that was my foray, in, um, well, you know, throughout into diversity. Um, so, you know, those things sort of, um, those leadership experience I leveraged into my career. You know, I, I would say in terms of life after college, you know, stay true to yourself, celebrate and share your awesome Filipina self. Um, so that's what I did when I moved into my um, early career. <clears throat> I would say my, you know, my uh, extracurricular activities from high school to college, then into what I called my extracurriculars at Boeing, um, also sort of followed, um, you know, three, three avenues. Uh, environmental. Now, I didn't do so much environmental at Michigan because Michigan, the whole state, right, did recycling. You, you get paid 10 cents a can. So it was, recycling was just a non-issue at Michigan. When I came to St. Louis, um, it was interesting to me when they changed over from aluminum cans in the vending machines to plastic bottles, the recycling receptacles went away. So um, I would say uh, sort of a lesson in persistence. And um, Sean, I know you uh, interned at, at um, Boeing in St. Louis. Uh, you might've noticed there were blue containers for recycling in the buildings. Um, when we started down that journey in the early 2000s of trying to get Boeing to recycle, you know, I just kept asking the questions, why aren't you um, recycling these bottles you used to recycle the cans? Well, um, you know, there it used to be the vendor that would take the cans for the money. 
well, now they don't want the bottles, so the plastic bottles, so those were just getting thrown away. So, um, you know, a few of us uh, engineers just start to, you know, grassroots, um, taking the bottles home ourselves, still kept asking, asking the questions. And then finally, and I have the email somewhere where my email was forwarded to someone, and to some extent, they were just told, um, just telling their, um, you know, subordinate, can you just make her go away? So I kept asking and asking, why can't we recycle? And then finally got uh, connected with someone in uh, environmental health services. And they said, yeah, we can um, put recept receptacles outside. So we formed this group called BEEP, Boeing Employees for Environmental Protection. I made that little roadrunner guy there. And, um, and uh, our, our motto was one, two, three, four, recycle on your way out the door. And um, we were told those receptacles would never come into the buildings. Housekeeping would never allow it. It would create too much mess and too many bugs. And, um, and now you look at it and we're doing all types of recycling. Um, there's many green teams all over the, um, the enterprise. So uh, I just look at that as a story of persistence. Um, you know, just keep asking and asking and eventually, you know, don't be too much of a pest about it. But, you know, just ask, ask the, smart, the smart questions. So, um, you know, I went into Boeing uh, doing software engineering, which is ironic because um, I hated my computer science classes um, in college. My friends would, uh, would find me asleep. Do you guys still have couches in the women's restrooms on North Campus? Um, they would find me hiding in the, in, in the restrooms sleeping uh, when I should have been working on my uh, computer assignment. <laughs> So um, my one friend thinks it's ironic that I went into um, software engineering after college, but um, that's where I ended up. I, I worked on the F-18 jet that you see there. Um, and uh, that one highlight that Sean shared, me flying in the, you know, the full-on dome. So we're surrounded by a dome. And we're, I was actually in a section of the airplane that was on hydraulics and shaked. And um, so one night, and this was early in my career, you know, one of the greater highlights happened early in my career. Uh, one night I was working on a, what we call the hot patch, which was going to go out to the field, you know, desert storm, all before you guys were born, desert storm. And, um, and I handed the patch over the integrator and he was going to take it over the dome. And I said, can I go home now? Cause it was late. And he's like, well, don't you want to fly it? Said, yeah, sure. So I, um, <laughs> I crashed it on the deck of the, um, air carrier, the carrier deck. Um, they kept reminding me how I was, um, you know, I just crashed a uh, multi-million dollar aircraft, aircraft and uh, yeah. So um, <laughs> I am not a video game player, needless to say. I was not able to land it on the deck. Um, <clears throat> uh, I did that a little bit more with um, more in the defense core software tools. Uh, along the way, I also chaired um, National Engineers Week. And then um, while I was in Future Combat Systems, we uh, formed what we called, um, at the time, Boeing. Asian American Professional Association, BAPA. Um, they were called affinity groups at the time. They were the, um, I guess, uh, minority groups or uh, underrepresented groups uh, that we did things like positive. We held um, lunch and learns panels and, uh, and actually it was very strong Filipino membership there. Um, I can't say that I got into the Filipino community here, but um, I did, uh, I do generally try to connect with Filipinos at work. Um, so we are, I'm, I'm still um, active in, in all of these things to some extent where I can be, you know, panels or, um, or working events, um, still an advisor for that group. And then at the same time, while, um, uh, while doing all of this, I also did my master's at University of uh, Washington, University in St. Louis, um, information management and uh, business administration, sort of with information management, it sort of followed along my career path of moving from more technical um, to more managerial. So, um, you know, that, that just, you know, followed my career as I moved from more software engineering to more software um, supplier management, and then um, on, on to corporate audit, where uh, that's where I got to see a lot of the company um, travel to Singapore and Australia, um, every, every part of the company, um, definitely recommend any sort of rotational program if you go into corporate America. <clears throat> I know um, a lot of uh, folks on the phone are, are nurses. Uh, so, you know, I know there's a traveling nurse program, you know, take advantage of those types of opportunities. Um, so I would say in, in terms of going through all of this, right, um, especially, and I didn't say too much about it in my um, college years, uh, usually I was one of the few um, engineering females 
in my classes. Um, we would band together, and actually, one other um, you know Filipina engineer was a good friend of mine, and um, and then uh, another uh, you know a Chinese um, American engineering student um, friend from elementary school actually. So we would always the three of us be together. Um, supporting each other and, and they were the ones that would find me in the um, ladies room on the <laughs> on the couch hiding from working on my computing assignments so you know um, definitely I would say you know look for opportunities sort of what Reno referenced you've got your um, artistic self your your extracurricular activities you've got your professional for me I blended the two at Boeing um, that was how I found my groups um, my communities at Boeing um, a lot of uh, I, I hung out with a lot of people from work and um, and then, you know, same from, from schooling. So uh, I will say in terms of representation, media, uh, meritocracy or representation, when I get into the next slide, I'll, I'll definitely talk about that more. Um, as a, a founding member of BAPA and, uh, and representing there, uh, definitely we made sure, you know, Filipinos, people knew that Filipinos were around. When I came down to um, St. Louis in the early or late 90s, it was very, uh, and it, St. Louis is still very black and white. So, um, but you know, I would go into the grocery store and I'd feel like people were staring at me. Um, it's definitely more di more diverse now. Uh, definitely not as diverse as California, maybe. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, St. Louis is, is interesting. Let's leave it at that. <clears throat> um, so when I moved into management, um, I actually uh, got married at the same time, um, had my first two kids, at, in my first uh, manager job, right back to back. And um, I actually had my uh, senior manager at the time ask me, uh, when I told, told him I was expecting my second, um, he asked me, oh, no, Lisa, I think we've known, and I, I had known him since I started at Boeing. So he's like, I think we're good enough friends I can ask you, how many kids are you planning on having? And I was just like, what? Um, I think just the two, but uh, obviously you can see I decided to have a third. But um, uh, yeah, it was, um, it was a, a shocking uh, a surprise to me because of maternity leave. Um, you know, the first, with my first child, I felt like I, um, you know, it's just, had just become a manager. I needed to rush back. So I actually went back to work after six or um, seven weeks. Um, and then with my second, I was sort of, when I, I was actually afraid to tell them that I was expecting. Um, I told my director, well, my, my management knew, my direct management knew, um, and when we went to go tell my director, um, his first thing out of his mouth was, uh, well, actually my, my senior manager was like, oh, we're gonna have to promote you now because you know, now you got more, more mouths to feed. You have to make sure we get you a good raise. And I'm just like, no, we know that um, performance you know, dictates that, not family situation. And, um, and my director muttered, and yeah, there's no out of sight, out of mind. And I was just like, what? Because another one of his directors went on military leave, which was just as long as maternity leave, but no one questions that. So, um, so yeah, I, I was uh, a little taken aback by that, and I, um, that was the point where I decided it's time for me to get out of there. Um, uh, they don't appreciate um, like the full self. So um, I moved out of there uh, in uh, and went into from the core research and technology side to um, defense. And actually when I had my second child, I was, um, you know, I was still trying to prove, prove myself, right? But um, I, I decided at that point, like, yeah, no, I am gonna take the full 12 weeks. I don't need to rush back. And, um, and then I, I switched jobs. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, I, I, even though when I, went, when I went back, I did take her on, like I actually talk, took my daughter on a trip with me didn't even tell my, my work and my friend in Seattle watched her for me while I went to a meeting that the customer actually didn't even show up for. So I flew out to be face to face with the customer and I, I ended up um, doing a WebEx with them. So, um, so I, I tell that story in terms of, you know, work-life balance and starting a family. Um, you know, just be cognizant of it. Don't, um, don't push yourself because no one's going to really appreciate it um, uh, or, or realize what you're going through for them when, and like I said, the customer didn't even realize that my management wanted me to be more face-to-face -face with them and they didn't even show up. So, um, so that was when I uh, left that organization and went back into defense, sort of still along the same lines in terms of domain. Um, and, uh, you know, just sort of progressed in my career there. When I became a senior manager, I, I had my um, third child. 
sort of uh, <laughs> convinced my husband. I was like, well, I'm a senior manager now. Can I, can we just have a third? I, I've already got the job. Let me <laughs> just have a third. Um, so, uh, so I, you know, again, took the full 12 weeks to, you know, no one's going to really tell um, when you're back or not. I did come back in the middle of it to um, hire another manager because um, one of my um, first line managers left, but, you know, um, Boeing's flexible enough uh, to do all that. Uh, so it was great. Um, and then, you know, rest of my career, boring data analytics, technology strategy. Um, and then, you know, just uh, women of color, to, you know, there's just different aspects of, and, and opportunities out there to leverage um, in different parts of industry. So, you know, I would just say part of, part of career wise, you know, advocate for your career, seek opportunities, build that network formal and informal. Like, like I said, a lot of my network came from my extracurricular activities too. Um, and I will say though, when I did become a senior manager um, in terms of meritocracy versus uh, representation, um, I was constantly being told by people, um, Alisa, you need to get this job. Uh, they need diversity. I said, that is not the reason I should get the job. And I was um, in a group of all white males. Uh, they had two white female first line managers, no senior managers. Uh, and um, when I got the job, I had people, oh, congratulations, how did you get that? Um, well, I applied for it, I interviewed, and they selected me. You know, oh, it sounded like they gave it to you, that you were appointed. And I was just like, no, I applied for it. <laughs> I interviewed and I was selected. And then I would have other people come up to me and say, Alisa, oh, I just want to let you know, the wolves are at your door. And I was like, what, what does that mean? Oh, I sit in meetings. I know there's, there's people who, who, don't want, who want you to fail, but I, I'm, I'm there to support you. I'm like, okay, well, you know, not everyone has to like me. Um, that's fine. I'll just, you know, I'll just do my job as best I can. But um, yeah, I mean, you know, sitting in meetings, being the only, only female, um, being the only person of color in my current job, my, um, my boss is, is, a, is a great advocate for diversity. And um, he actually had our global diversity um, and engagement um, focal come speak in his leadership team meeting. I, of course, came into the meeting a little late. So I snuck in the back, back of the room, sat down by, you know, um, one of my coworkers that motioned for me to sit next to him. And then um, the chief of staff for my, my VP, he called, he, she motioned for me, come to the front, come to the front. She made me sit right in front, um, front of the table. And um, she's like, oh, we wanted to make sure that you're, you're near the front for when, for, for when Amy, the global diversity focal came and spoke because I was the only person of color in the room. There were some white women, um, but generally, I, um, I was the only person calling the room. And I don't know if you guys do it, but I do it. Um, I go into rooms, I go into meetings, and I count. I count how many women are there, and I count how many people of color are there. And I just do that for myself, just for awareness. Um, but yeah, I mean, oftentimes I'm the only one. Um, when I was uh, a manager, um, senior manager, um, earlier in my career, I would run meetings, 40, 50 people in the room, and I was the only person of color and only woman, and I was the one running it. So I would tell them, okay, you, got a, you guys got a five minute break. Good luck with the bathrooms. I have mine all to myself. So, um, you know, for me being, uh, being there for meritocracy, I felt like I was the best person for the job when I was selected for a senior manager, but also I knew I was there to represent. Um, so, you know, I definitely would always point out, you know, look, I'm the only person of color here, or I'm the only woman here. Um, you know, sometimes we would, we would be in a celebration and they would pass me, you know, um, they'd be like, oh, Lisa, can you take the picture? I'm like, yeah, that's right. Yeah, make the Asian person take the picture because they're good at taking pictures. And they'd be like, oh, I can't believe she said that. But, you know, I, I wanted to make sure they knew that I knew, you know, I mean, they, didn't, they weren't doing it because of that. But I like to make, I don't know if they make people feel uncomfortable with things, but um, make them aware. So um, I think in college, Reno, I think they called me blunt as wood. Um, when you wanted to uh, know something uh, and have the truth be told to you, uh, people came to me. <laughs> so, um, I, 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 I like to um, be truthful. I'm not as blunt as I used to be. You, know, you, you have to learn in your professional career to not just blur out whatever you want to say, but um, definitely uh, folks still realize that I, I speak my mind. So, um, and I think that's all I had. Oh, well, in terms of family, you know, Reno talked about this stuff too. Definitely, it is, uh, um, 
it's, it's something to, to keep in mind. Um, I have, uh, you know, I say keep family close when possible. My sister moved down here after um, I did, um, and then my parents, and then now we actually all live on the same street. Um, my sister's two doors down one way, and my parent, my mom, uh, my dad passed away earlier this year. Uh, my mom is uh, five doors the other way. So, um, so yeah, that's my family, and uh, that is my uh, um, other activity, <laughs> which also follow my uh, my recycling and diversity and STEM. So, that's me. And sleep as much as you can before having kids. That's all I have to say about that. <laughs> Thanks. Yes, thank you so much, Elisa. So, um, yeah, we have the hour until eight. Um, so this can be any questions that you guys have. Feel free, you don't have to just type it. Feel free to unmute. Um, yeah, just be respectful, obviously. Um, and be appropriate. I would like to ask one question um, to start things off. So, um, I guess as one of two or three grad students, in FASA, uh, a lot of the undergrads, which is basically everyone else, comes to me for like advice. And I find <laughs> it funny because in reality, I literally have no idea what I'm gonna do with my life, which I have talked about at length with the people who ask me these questions. So, um, but I, I still get them. I do like helping them out. But, you know, given your experience, what would you say to undergrads who feel as if like their commitment to their major or like internship experience dictates what they do after college. Because um, a lot of times people come up to me and they feel like, you know, they're like digging themselves a hole. Um, like I got this internship here, how could I enter X industry? Or like, um, you know, I chose this major, is it too late to switch? Or um, does that necessarily, I, I don't wanna be defined like by my major in my career. And um, my answer is of course not, but I don't have the experience to speak on that. So. Um, yeah, if either of you would like to speak on that, Reno or Elisa, please do. Um, well, I guess for me, I always knew I was going to be an engineer. So, um, so that's a little harder. What kind of engineer and, and what I was going to do at Boeing. Um, I will say I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up here at Boeing. Um, my, my current boss has asked me what do I want to do nat next. And I'm like, oh, I don't know. Um, I like what I'm doing now, but uh, I guess I can figure it out later. So, um, you know, um, going from a big university to a big corporation, uh, you know, you, you think it's daunting, but you always find your, your little um, communities and niches, I would say, that make it more comfortable. Um, for, Boeing, for me and Boeing, uh, the opportunities were pretty much, you know, I just go and see what was out there and just apply to it. Um, other people have more uh, have, have crafted more of their own career and what to follow. Um, like I said, I still don't even know what I want to do next. Um, so uh, I would just say, know what your interests are and then look for the opportunities. Don't be, um, you know, like I graduated with an electrical engineering degree. I maybe did a little bit of it because I did um, assembly language um, software. So that was more closer to electrical engineering than, than that's the only time I ever did anything. Uh, related to my degree. And I'll, I'll let Reno jump in. I was a uh, kinesiology major my freshman year. And I switched to English my sophomore year. And when I graduated with an English and mass communication degree, I was panicking because I did not know what I was going to do. So for any undergrads who are feeling that they're trapped by their degree, um, you have to take steps in order to feel untrapped. Those steps would be talking to a counselor, um, maybe having an experience outside of your major and an internship with a company outside of your major to see if that's something that you would like to try. But if you're on a track like engineering or nursing and you're not sure you want to be a nurse, then the rule of thumb is to change majors to something more general, unless you know, you want to be a nurse, to have the income in as a nurse, because it's a stable job. But then you make sure to open the umbrella of your other interests so you don't feel trapped in that trade that you're in. And that's why I'm a big advocate of having two resumes, one of your professional career and one of your interests. And um, that will 
help anybody feel that there's a whole world for you to explore. Uh, for me, my work was after graduating is I went to the Filipino community. I went to the Philippine X community. I worked for a Filipino American record label in California. So it was an extension of college. It was a party every three days. And we were at clubs. I was a DJ, so I was in that scene here in the San Francisco Bay Area. I didn't really grow up until I met my wife and things got serious. And um, the Filipino community has gotten me far with those opportunities. That's my story. Your story is gonna be your own unique story, but do things to put yourself in a situation where you feel like you can explore different parts of yourself because your major is only one part of you. There's other people who have a higher degree of, of um, threshold that their major is who they are. Like I'm 98% going to be a, a, a scientist and that's what they devote their time to or a doctor. Of course, when you go to med school, you're gonna have to devote a lot of time there, but you're going to have to um, put the work in, put in and implement the steps in order for you to have a diverse experience in life because your major is one part of you. Yeah, and definitely, you know, chiming in on that, uh, you know, you, you guys saw my, ex my extracurriculars are more what define me than my job probably, and I definitely blended those two, so. Um, I, I think there's definitely opportunity to do that as you go out into the world. And if, yeah, if you guys have any questions about engineering or corporate life, feel free, reach out. <laughs> I can, I can, I'll, I'll, I can talk to you. Over. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> we do have a question from Isabel. Isabel, do you want us to just ask it for you or do you want to unmute? Like what? No, I want to hear her voice. Okay. Isabel, ask the question. So you have a request now. So. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Isabel. Uh, I just graduated um, yes. from UFAS alum, and I'm also a nurse, so fitting the stereotype. <laughs> I was wondering if either of you, I don't know if you already talked about this, but I was wondering if either of you got involved with any sort of Filipinx organizations after undergrad, um, and if so, would you recommend doing so for anyone else graduating? Absolutely. Get involved in your community and still stay connected. Uh, sorry, Elisa, I just jumped in there, but I was so excited. To oh, no. Um, yeah, well, I mean, definitely Reno followed that that path way more than I did. I did it more from um, from within my work, so. Right, and um, I was just going to say that I'm glad you brought that up because within your trade, there's going to be organizations for Filipino nurses. There's a plethora of Filipino nurse, nurse associations in your local area. So whatever area you decide to settle in, there's going to be a medical community there for you to do uh, you know, stay connected to people of your background, the Filipino community. So F, the answer is yes, be involved. Yeah, I, I would definitely recommend it too. It's, it's definitely one way to form um, a community in your professional life. Um, just to give an example, I'm part of a, a real estate group for Filipino Americans in real estate. And it's based in California. And um, we meet all virtually and talk about our real estate experience. Some are real estate brokers, some are property tax consultants like me, some are investors who, who own property, and we just band together in order to, you know, to provide support to each other. So hopefully, um, you know where you wanna settle, or are you gonna stay in Michigan? Is that Isabel? She's trying to unmute. <laughs> She's okay. Well, wherever you land, there's going to be an organization for you. Oh, yeah, I was just going to say, um, yeah, for now, I'm probably going to stay in Michigan for a few years. But after that, I don't don't really know. Yeah, I was uh, my family. We were involved with the um, medical association and um, there's always a party every year on 16 Mile and Big Beaver. And um, that's where I grew up. Yep. So I didn't know Lisa until college, but, you know, it's weird how the intersections in life and uh every year we go down there for the medical association party and all of yeah. that so there's always you know for filipino nurses there's definitely definitely a, a network for you um i think angelina had a question and you are now required to talk so please unmute <laughs> 
Okay. <laughs> I'm bossy too. No problem. Um, yeah, my name is Angelina. I'm a sophomore. Um, so my question was kind of about like um, how Rena was talking about the second resume, like regarding your interests, stuff you didn't study in college. So like how would you suggest finding opportunities to like show that you have experience in those interests and that you have like some kind of credibility even if you didn't study it in college? So what is your interest? Um, I guess for me, I'm like, I, I like, um, like art and like graphic design or something like that. Um, so yeah. My, uh, my What's your major? Um, I'm in computer science. Ah. <laughs> that can intersect into an interesting mix. Um, my experience with that second resume is that as you learn to get to know that part of you, you may just start with one line and then you build on it and build on it as, as you build that resume. Um, but if you, if the, the trick is, in terms of being credible, is that you gather those experiences over time and ensure that you have references to those experiences, right? The references are huge, huge. I still call a mentor from 15 years ago for a reference, 20 years ago for a reference. So that will add credibility to your second resume for sure. It may have been just in an event you had um, where you, uh, you know, presented your, your work and uh, you get feedback from people and you keep that feedback as a memoir of some sort. And then um, you show that as a supplemental to your resume. But um, there isn't a specific way to do your resume or specific thing, but you just build it up over time because that will take longer than your, in some regards, maybe not, it just depends. But your professional career will might have more of that distinct build up in, in a resume than your second second resume. And maybe you guys bring back the FAFSA yearbook and you can help uh, design it and that can be on your resume. Yes. Oh yeah, make sure you put your your uh, your college stuff, the stuff you've done in college yeah. um, down and don't forget that. <laughs> I try not to forget even though I'm getting older and. I'm starting to lose it in memory. It happens. But you um, you remember those times and then put it in your resume so you, you don't forget about it. So we have questions from Izzy and then Angela and then Mango. So uh, Izzy, can you go first? Um, first off, I just want to thank you both for providing some really practical advice from a Philippine ex perspective, something we really don't hear much at all. Um, so my question is, what advice do you have for those starting in entry level positions after grad or like internships as a minority or a Filipino American? And how can you set yourself up for success in fields where there's really a lack of representation? So, um, you know, I think Reno talked about representation for, versus meritocracy, um, you know, especially in the, these turbulent times. Uh, you know, people, people still say, I don't see color. Um, I, you know, there, it, there's no racism out there. Um, I, I made sure people knew who I was, right? Um, I was on a panel recently for, uh, for the um, Asian group at, at Boeing, and they were merging with, or, you know, running the panel with the, um, it's called the generations group. So they had someone of Asian descent from each generation and um, different backgrounds. And I was the only Filipino Gen Xer. Um, there was another Gen Xer that was uh, Japanese. There was a you know, boomer that was Japanese back in descent. And um, I was the only one that talked about how I was proud to be Filipino and how, um, you know, the, the Japanese, um, the person of Japanese descent started out with, my dad told me, you know, you know, in the Japanese culture, the nail that sticks out gets hammered down. And I was like, that's not what Filipinos do. We're pretty loud. You know, we're here and, um, and we're proud of it. Um, you know, we're, we're brown and proud. And, uh, and that is very evident when you see the Asian group at Michigan, I'm sorry, Michigan, <laughs> at Boeing. And um, the Filipinos were always the very outspoken ones. Um, I always found that my experiences and my stories that I shared with folks were, were different in that I always spoke up versus, um, and I got, actually got very frustrated with some of the leadership of the BAPA group. Um, like, come on guys, speak up, because they were just always so quiet and timid. Um, and I mean, and same with the females too, but, um, and 
so I, I would say just, you know, that makes you unique. So don't try to hide it. Um, share your experiences and, um, and that'll, you know, you may be the nail that sticks out, but it, you'll be noticed. Right. Um, so, I mean, that's my, that's my take on it. And you can't hide this. It's proud. You can't hide that. Yeah. Be proud of it. <laughs> My answer is going to be a little bit different from Elisa's. Uh, when you're starting off an entry-level position in internship, you need to get your job done. And um, you want to move up, you have to understand what the rules are. At the same time, you can't conform and hide who you are. Um, so when, the, when you're in a field where there's a lack of rep representation, be aware that there's subtle bias from the people who make those decisions who moves up. And that bias is, is as Elisa tend, uh, tended to, is, how you look and they're going to wonder if you know you're going to have to do 15 20 good things in order for you to be recognized for someone in the majority who may do it three or four times correctly yeah and i would say um uh, definitely agree you, you definitely have to get the job done um a lot of people come into going entry level or um even internships and they're like how can i be vp next week um you know have realistic expectations and number one, get the job done before targeting your next job, right? Um, you know, I, I will say when I came into Boeing as a female engineer, I would have people tell me, oh, you're an engineer? And, and you know, frankly, when they interviewed me on campus, they were like, oh, you're an engineer and you, you have leadership experience? And they were really interested in that. I think that's different now. I think a lot of engineers coming in have a lot of leadership experience, but back in the day, not so much. Um, so in my first job, I was one of the you know few female engineers, and all the guys would be like, "You're an engineer. You don't seem like an engineer." I'm like, "Well, I am," and um, and I'm a nerd at heart, and um, will always be. Uh, when nerd guys would try to talk to me at work, I would just be like, uh, "Just send me an email." So to some extent, you also want to set the tone that you're not. Um, that's some flighty girl that they can flirt with or whatever, right? Um, I was very professional and very much, you know what, I don't have time for you to talk to me right now, just send me an email. So, um, you know, if anything, I, I had a mean reputation, but that <laughs> made sure that we stayed professional. <laughs> and um, one last thing I want to add to that is just, just be comfortable with who you are in the workspace because everyone has a different personality. Some people are more outspoken, others are more quiet, but just be comfortable with who you are, get the job done but don't hide from who you are um, with your cultural background because uh, a meritocracy is the rule of the land in most corporations. Um, and, but at the same time, you have to realize you have to do it 50 times correct while someone else may have to get it only five times correct in order for you to be moved up. Just know that reality exists and try to fight through it and change it once you're in the system, once you're in the corporation. What's your major again? Industrial engineering. There you go. So talk to Lisa. Shoot, shoot me your resume. I'll, I'll give you some. <laughs> <laughs> I would gladly. Thank you so much for your answers. Um, and I think the next question was from Angela. Yeah, hi. Uh, yeah, hi. Thank you so much for uh, doing all of this and speaking on your experiences. Um, I am a current senior, and I uh, just like, pretty sure haven't, like, done the, like, haven't gotten, like, the, the physical document, like, with the actual offer yet, but I just got offered a job for, like, full-time, and I'm now kind of, like, in that um, period right. where I'm thinking, like, uh, how am I going to make friends? <laughs> because my brother, who's uh, also graduated from Michigan, who, like, graduated six years ago, told me the, like, worst part about being an adult is it's, like, much harder to make friends, and he kind of had a similar experience, I think, to you guys, that he moved from Michigan. We were, like, born and raised in Michigan, and he moved to the South, and just kind of, like, hearing your stories, like, uh, Elisa, you moved south. To the south, and Reno, you moved to the West Coast, and I was kind of just curious, like, did you guys find that, like, initially, like, moving to a completely different place was, like, kind of isolating, or, like, did you find kind of, like, it was a struggle to make friends, and, like, if that's the case, like, what were some things that you kind of did to maybe like make more friends or kind of feel more at home? Because that's kind of like something I'm, I'm personally kind of afraid of <laughs> if I'm moving. And I'm not um, even really moving for my job, so. 
my sister claims that she moved down here because I was crying because I was so sad and lonely and that I took her futon so she was coming to get it. Um, and she stayed. Uh, you know, she, she claims, oh, I have a two bedroom, one bath, you know, come stay with me. There's so much room for you. So she'll still tell that story uh, to this day. But when she came down, um, you know, that was helpful. I'm not saying make a sibling or <laughs> move down with you, but I lucked out in that. But, um, you know, I found groups within Boeing to hang out with, um, all the guys I worked with, right? I'm an engineer, so it was a bunch of guys I was working with. They're like, oh, you remind us of this girl, you know, and she's an Asian girl, and she's in finance, where all the girls are in finance. Ironically, my, my husband was in finance and worked with all the women that were wives of the men that I worked with, but um, so I got, they hooked me up with this, this girl, right, that, they, that I reminded them of because she was Asian too. Um, you know, I, I would just say, find the, and especially when, um, where are you going to go work? Um, I'm working for Accenture, which is like a tech consulting firm, and I'm actually going to the Detroit office, so I'm not really leaving that much, but I'm anticipating <laughs> a lot of travel, so if, you know, Corona wasn't a thing, so who knows, but yeah, lot to ask. <laughs> Usually corporations have um, new employee groups, and Boeing does, um, Boeing has one, so usually that's a great place to meet people. Um, and they'll, you know, if it weren't Corona, they would have happy hours. I mean, I think they do do Zoom happy hours um, in those groups. I mean, like I said, we, we still do events, um, like you guys are doing this um, virtually over Zoom. So um, that's, that's one way, you know, you're, you're in a, a unique situation. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I, I think definitely at, at the corporate level, they will have groups for you to interact with. Yeah, so um, take advantage of that. Don't, don't shy away from it. I know for Accenture, they definitely have groups uh, for new employees that you could be involved with the different subgroups um, across the nation because it's nationwide. So that's that's a good thing. Um, so, uh, for my experiences, I, I went to the Filipino community. I went to the Filipino community, and that's gotten me a long way in terms of social circle, so, uh, social circles and network circles. And um, that's what you know. My experience, hopefully, is something that people can you know try to emulate in a way where if the community that you're going to has a Filipino community then that's a starting point for you to feel bonded with people right so um, and then my corporate setting they're all white so I just find different commonalities with them like sports or something like that <laughs> so gotcha gotcha uh, good luck thank you so much thanks and, and good luck in your new job oh sorry um, we have a question from Mango. Mango, do you want to speak on that? Sure, I'll take it. So um, one of my biggest flaws uh, is time management, which is very ironic because I'm going into the nursing field, which time management and priority is one of the biggest things for patient care. However, in my own personal life, that is not the case. So I like to balance a good amount of my personal stuff with the uh, professional aspects, but I kind of need, a, like, are there any tips in terms of, like, finding balance between, you know, uh, exploring the personal and uh, maintaining the professional? Because sometimes we get, like you said before, the professional can get very overwhelming, and it takes up the time that we would like to de delegate towards our personal interests. Um, yeah, first, I guess your nickname is Mango, so that's awesome. So, <laughs> um, in terms of balance, that's a lifelong, a lifelong thing. Um, it's not something that everyone gets right all the time. Just know that. Um, when I was your age, I always thought, oh, at a certain point at age 30, I'll have this balance just right. Then when I got to 30, I realized, no, I'm still working on that. It's still a work in progress. And even, at, even as the years have gone on, it's still a work in progress. Where I'll be more slated towards professional. And then I have to bring the meter back. And then I'm more slated to the personal to bring the meter back. It's a constant ebb and flow. It's a metronome that's going back and forth that you have to, you have to monitor on a daily basis. The one thing you, uh, I'll give um, that's a little bit more um, specific is that you have, to, you have to find strategies that work for you to find balance. So you need to have mental health time just for yourself. Um, you need to have that time for yourself and then you'll find yourself hopefully performing better professionally and with your relationships personally. Uh, but but definite, definite mental health time 
for yourself. So mm -hmm. important. Yeah, and I, I'll have to say that I'm bad at that. Um, I'm always uh, checking emails for work. I'm on all hours of the night, especially when the kids go to sleep. Um, my <laughs> husband and I took our, and, and you're going to love this, blackberries with us on our honeymoon. Because um, he's a corporate guy too. But um, yeah, I know Blackberry guys. Um, I still have mine because they don't make you turn that back in. This is a Blackberry. Ooh, look at that archival thing. I'm going to save that for the history books. Um, they, uh, you know, um, when, I, when I first took over one group as their manager, they, uh, I, I did a session with them and, um, you know, asked me anything. And one of the questions was, Alisa, what's your um, uh, view of work-life balance? And, um, and I, I sort of said, I sort of understand why you're asking this because you may see emails from me at 2 a.m. just because I shoot them out when they come to me. Um, but don't feel like you have to respond to them. It's just, if I don't send it out, I'll get stuck in my draft email. Um, you know, and then I, I tried to switch to, okay, Lisa, you're not gonna, you're not gonna send anything out so people don't think you're crazy. Just wait till the morning. And, um, and no, I, I, I know that there's some setting that says, you know, send, the, send this on delay, but I've um, only used that recently. Um, but I, I, I will say, um, you know, similar to what Rena was saying, you're gonna have to find it, your own balance for yourself. Um, I, I think, uh, you know what, oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, that you gotta have uh, some physical and mental balance also. So to answer your question specifically, what tips would you give to balance your work and your hobbies? Um, spend time and staying physically fit if possible. All right, like sweating is actually a thing for you to get that balance, help you get that balance. And then mentally de-stressing in the moments that you know you need to de-stress. So it's okay to Netflix binge for one day, but then just know that the next day, you're probably gonna have to balance that out, right? So it's a constant push, uh, push and pull internally. And when we say stuff like you have to figure that out on your own, I, I don't want you to think, oh, shoot, you know, it's just like whatever. But <laughs> um, specifically, you have to physically um, get your body in motion with you. And then mentally, that get in motion with what you want to achieve. Um, and for me, it's just constant, constant every day. I'm on a, I try to stay regimented towards staying balanced by like working out three or four times a week, then spending time with my family, spending time with the people I enjoy being around, and then focusing my time professionally. And then after that, doing things I enjoy. So um, I love watching movies and reading and writing. So find something that you enjoy that will help you get through those tough times. Yeah, thank you. Thank yeah, you. for me, my downtime is uh, spending time with my kids as much as possible. Um, I think that, um, you know, actually, I, I never plan to have kids, and that blows my daughter's mind. <laughs> I never plan to get married and have kids. She's like, what? I'm like, yeah, you wouldn't have existed in my old, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I mean, just having a girl was, was mind-blowing for me. But, um, yeah, I, you know, we, we, we would have sessions at work. Um, you know, women in leadership would have these panels, and you would ask these executives, uh, women, you know, um, how do you find, you know, how do you deal with work-life balance? And one, one of them actually said, there is none. You will miss your child's ballet recital. You will miss this. And I'm just like, no, I don't want to do that. Um, so that's why I sort of say you have to decide for yourself what you want to miss, because I've known people to leave jobs because they're like, no, this is taking up too much of my time. I want to spend time with my family. Um, I had a friend, he left GE because his, his, his president, um, well, his, his like VP told him a story of, of a meeting with the president. He was leaving this meeting saying he had to go to his daughter's graduation. My wife's going to kill me if I miss it. And the president, the CEO was like, these jobs come only along once in a while. Wives come and go. <laughs> uh, as soon as he heard that story, he left that company because, you know, he was on the fast, fast track, but he was just like, no, they have no concept of, you know, family. So, um, you know, I mean, as you get into your, different careers and jobs you're going to be faced with different challenges like i had to lose that one group because they were you know upset that i had a second child really quick um so I want to reiterate one of my points is surround yourself with the people you want to be around in your professional yep. life and your personal life obviously mm -hmm. um so mango you're going to be a nurse right 
So you're going to do three straight eights or four straight eights, eight hour shifts, one, two, three, four, possibly. Then you're going to have two or three days off, maybe, depending, unless you're a strike nurse, then you're going to travel and, you know, do that. So you have a lot of options as a nurse, but within that nursing schedule, right, that's a challenge. So you just have to like mentally prepare for it and know what remedies you can do to stay balanced. I know like the um, medical companies, like, you know, the, the corporate medical um, owners of real estate, like Kaiser and Sutter and all that stuff out here in the West Coast, they made an impetus of importance at HR level to give tips on, H, on uh, work-life balance. So just know that that's an impetus for every, uh, within every corporation now, especially in your field. Yeah, I think, I think there is a, a um, you know, especially with the, the different um, differences in the cultures of the workforces now, um, there is a lot of focus on that. I mean, Boeing has 12 weeks paternity leave. Um, now, they never had that in the past when my husband, had, when we had our three kids, he didn't get time off. Um, yeah. He's very mad about it. And that he told me, no, we can't have any more kids, but. Um, <laughs> anyway. one, last, one last thing is uh, a lot of corporations that I don't mind us has an employee assistance program called EAPs that allows yep. um, you to go and talk to a third party if you're struggling through something, counseling session, which is part of your employment, right? And they have other assistance programs to help you get that work-life balance. So just yeah, there's that. definitely a lot of resources at work that you can utilize that a lot of people don't. Thanks so much. And then I would like to do a question from Virginia. And that'll be our last one. And then after I do have a thing I want I do want to close on. So um Virginia, go ahead. Yes. Uh thank you guys again for um for coming here. Um so hopefully you can still hear me. I'm wearing a mask, but um my question is about um mentors, men finding mentors. Um, how do you find mentors and how do you maintain your relationships with your mentors um, in your personal and professional lives? Well, for the for, uh, first Reno. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, sure. Because I was so excited to jump in here. Um, where you, the stage that you're in right now, you have mentors all around you. It's your professors and it's your counselors at U of M. Make sure you stay in touch with them when you leave campus. All right. One of my biggest mentors was my Asian American, Asian Pacific American uh, literature professor, Dr. Samita, who's in Washington now. Um, and Melissa Torres, she she teaches that now at LSNA. Um, I'm sorry, Melissa Borja. Um, I'm still in touch with Dr. Sa Dr. Samita, um, and he's I consider my real first mentor uh, ever in my life. So all of you should have mentors in your classes, your professors, somebody, stay in touch with them and add, add it to your contact list and check in on them and that relationship will grow from there. And then as you go through internships, then make sure that you have a supervisor you like. <laughs> I'm, you know, you, you don't have a choice in that matter, but um, someone who's been on your side and stay in touch with them because you're going to need references in the real world, right? So um, I my I have a list of about 25 people through my time that I can call up for a reference, and it, all it is is just managing and maintaining that relationship and doing it legitimately, not just because you need a reference, but it's a legitimate relationship that you have with them. Um, so that's that's something that you should be always on the lookout for in the back of your mind, um, but not just for reasons because I need a reference, but because it's people that you want a reference from, people that, that inspire you, people that help you, and people who have helped you along the way. Yeah, and I will say, ironically, um, my VP just asked me today, Elisa, do you have a mentor? Um, and my response had to be, I haven't met with a mentor in a long time. Um, I've definitely been more active um, as a mentor mentee relationship with a lot of um, um, up and coming uh, female and male engineers. Um, I actually had a, a Filipino um, male engineer contact me from the last panel I, we had, um, you know, asking to set up a mentor relationship. 
um, you know, I, I have informally been reaching out to people, um, you know, just to get some career guidance in term, you know, that I've, I've known throughout the years. Um, I, I sent Sean a, a video of uh, one of the, <laughs> one of the executives here at Boeing that's Filipino. He's, he was the first Filipino American general um, and he works at Boeing now. And uh, he actually did this video for, um, for Asian American Heritage Month, which was um, with, with um, Will I Am from the Black Eyed Peas. Um, so yeah, uh, yeah, that's an informal relationship that I formed with, with that um, individual. Um, and I would say, just so, sort of like what Reno was saying, as you go through your career, you're gonna meet people and network with people formally and informally and, and just you know keep those, um, keep those connections. And it is on the mentee to set up and um, rec like recurring meetings and have topics and, and, and keep those relationships moving forward. Um, I view my role as a mentor or mentee as um, really connecting people, listening to what they um, are interested in doing and then reaching out to my network uh, to say, hey, could you talk to this person? They're interested in moving to the East Coast um, or they're interested in, in, um, in this uh, job area at Boeing. So, um, you know, I, I really see my, my role as more as connecting and then um, to establish your own mentor relationships, just, you know, c continue to follow up on things and, and keep it moving forward. Cause I know I, I dropped the ball on that. And um, again, since I don't know what I want to be when I grow up yet, they're pushing me to, <laughs> to figure that out. So. Yeah. Um, and just, I wanted to just add in regarding that as you get older, it's going to start slowly shift right now. You're the mentee. You're just starting off. So you're in a sweet spot right now. You're just asking people for help and it's on them. If they say no, it's like forget them and go to on to the next, right? But then as you get older, you slowly shift and morph into this mentor that you didn't realize existed because of your experiences. Because you're gonna have more experiences that people will find valuable and ask questions on. So as you go through that shift and that transformation, you should you should welcome it. Don't fight it, welcome it. Now at the stage you're on, this, you're at the beginning. This is like the best spot because sometimes I think back like, oh, I wish I did that or I wish I did that. Now you can gather those contacts now while you're at U of M and um, get involved with the alumni group. People have different opinions on the U of M alumni group, um, but I've met a lot of Michigan people out here in the Bay Area, Bay Area just because of the alumni group. And I'm obviously the mentor now to these people who are moving over for a new job or uh, they have U of M alumni events that I go to to watch U of M football. But people have had different, different experiences, but for me, it's been a positive one. I don't work for them. Right yeah, now. actually, you know, you know tagging um, onto that, um, my current job, I actually, to some extent, got because of a U of M alumni relationship. I, um, you know, I, I saw someone in this organization that I knew. I don't remember how I met him. I just remember that he went to University of Michigan too. And I reached out to him and I said, hey, I saw this posting out there. Um, can you, um, you know, get me connected to someone or tell me what, more about it? And he actually put a good word in for me. Um, I'm not, I, I don't think that's why I got the job. I think it may be why I got the interview maybe. Um, but, uh, you know, that was a Michigan alumni um, connection. And quite frankly, I really don't even know how I met him. Uh, but we, we definitely, you know, similar to, to identifying with someone, hey, you're Filipino, I'm Filipino too. Hey, you went to Michigan, I went to Michigan too. So we do that here too. Um, and, and, and that is a great way to, to build a network too. Right, and um, uh, one word of, or one experience, the experience I want to relay real quick is that the Wolverine connection is, is completely legitimate and it's completely valuable. Um, but some of my mentors actually are Buckeyes. Sorry, they're Ohio I'm just throwing that one. Others are Spartans. They're MSU people, <laughs> yeah. right? Like there's a lot of MSU people here. Right. And it's like uh, w when I got out of college, I was so Wolverine biased, like about you them, blah blah blah, blah blah blah. And then you're out in the workforce and you're realizing there's people you. from Arizona, other come up <laughs> other schools, and um, you, you just have to relate to the fact that you all went to a school and you have pride in your school, but Big Ten or yeah, right. But you still you still want to work together with those people, right? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I, I got one job before my time at um, after my time at Classified. The man, the director was a Buckeye, and we we're talking about that rivalry in the interview. The interview was basically Wolverine versus Buckeyes, and we we're just talking about that rivalry. And, and she hired me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, they don't really so, hate us. Yeah, they it, do. It, it, it's really highlighted in the in the sports, but in my experience in the workforce, it's been loved. So, hopefully, that's your experience. Yeah. Um, so yeah, in, interesting. Um, uh, all all of my leisure wear has Michigan on it. Like I don't have very much that doesn't have Michigan on it. And so when people see that I and I, my lanyard for work has Michigan on it, and when people see that, they're like, "Oh, you went to Michigan?" I'm like, "Yeah, where'd you go?" I know. Yes, you hate us. Everyone hates us. And then um, yeah, they'll try to goad me. Oh, you guys won or you guys lost? And I'm like, I'm not sporty. I went there for the education. For the industry. So did we have a game? I don't know. <laughs> I'm the opposite of Reno with the sports. But, um, you know, it, it still is, is a, you know, you can poke fun at each other. Um, I, I had one guy on my team. He was a Buckeye. And he put a Buckeye on my, my keyboard. And I came into the meeting. and I was like, what is this? A chestnut? And he got so upset with me. He thought I was going to get upset because it was a Buckeye. And I was like, oh, is this a, oh wait, this is your mascot. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you can't beat the Wolverine mascot, but um, anything, co you know, that you can find common connections um, is, is good to, to build that rapport. You know, Reno did it in an interview. Um, you, you do it with anyone that you, you meet generally. So, um, yeah, definitely be, be proud of it and, uh, and and use it to your advantage, too. One last thing for me is that your degree from University of Michigan has a lot of weight in the real world. It really does. So know that that i'm a university of michigan wolverine when people see it on your resume they're they're gonna notice they're gonna notice if, if you get the job you throw that out the window because it doesn't matter what school you went to it's up to you at that point what you do with that job or internship but it'll get you in the door more often than not than other schools in my experience so um but once you're in that organization it's up to you because that's not gonna that's not gonna hold weight if you do a poor job in whatever you're doing thank you guys so much thanks so much. and um Jinyo, because you didn't point it out what is your major because i totally don't know that <laughs> i am an electrical engineering major oh there you go oh, send, send me your resume too <laughs> <laughs> we need people <laughs> And, um, we may be downsizing, when, but we still need people. <laughs> when we're talking about mentorship and all of that, um, that's one of my really big goals is to have the uh, BASA alumni more involved with the current students, because I feel like our generation did a poor job of that, of staying connected, because how many engineers are here, Lisa, that would benefit from your experience, right? Hey, raise your hand. Yeah, right. And... Um, I know a bunch of people our generation who are nurses in the business world. So that's something that I'm making it, making it a goal to get them involved somehow with the current FASA group. Um, and then uh, don't repeat our mistakes. So when you graduate, stay connected with the, the current students uh, 10 years from now or whatever it is and let them know where you are in, in life professionally at least. And then that will start yeah. that pattern of mentorship. Um, and I think that's the purpose of this call. We want to be mentors to all of you, so feel free to reach out to us at any time. And hopefully we can expand that network of people, our generation, who can, you know, a lot of times it's who you know. So if you get a job, sometimes it's who you know. So that, that would help all of you as you go into the workforce. Yep. And thank you, too. So um, we are six 